I bet you didn't see that one coming. It took me one and a half years, but it's finally done. Let's start this off with some initial info before we get to the juicy parts. Now that I'm studying musicology and have to do things like these more often, I need to preface this video by saying that this obviously isn't on the level of an actual academic paper or book. For that, I would have had to confine the theme by quite a lot more or do years of research, which would have included reading tons of books from the respective country, preferably in the original language, in this case Russian, and even gone to Russia myself to do field study, gone to live performances, or at the very least spend some time in a Russian university where Russian folk music is being researched. I unfortunately don't have the funding and time to do so, but fortunately there have been people who did that and wrote their results down in books and papers. One of those people is Ulrich Morgenstern, a German musicologist who wrote Volksmusikinstrumente und Instrumentale Volksmusik in Russland, or in English Folk Music Instruments and Instrumental Folk Music in Russia which pretty much saved this video. I definitely wouldn't have been able to pack as much valuable info into this if it weren't for his book. It's unfortunately only available in German though, but I hope one day it will be translated into other languages since he did some great research on Russian folk music. I've also used other sources and did some of my own analysis though, the sources of which you can find in the description. Regarding the content of this video, I chose not to include anything that I couldn't find enough info on, Anything that didn't seem relevant enough for composers, as this is a video aimed at composers, and anything that didn't have anything to do with specifically instrumental Russian music, since I already did a video on the vocal side of traditional Russian music. Unless it was something that I forgot to mention and felt I should add as a side note. I will also separate the analysis part into actual folk music and modern Russian music. The thing is that what we associate with Russian music is usually the latter, but I chose to include the former in case you want to get more historically accurate. Alright, the order of this video will be history, instruments, music theory, and then analysis. History. There has of course been music in Russia since a long time, but the problem is always that a lot of knowledge about history gets lost and especially outside of Russia, not many resources were put into researching it for quite a while. A big problem is also that due to the Christianization of Russia, non-church music, generally known as secular music, was forbidden. As an interesting side note, church music in Russia was rather isolated and therefore developed rather slowly. They sang in unison and octave parallels up to the 15th century, while Europe was already developing polyphony. There were still groups of professional musicians called the Skomaroch during these times that, aside from music, also did dances and plays. Mentions of them date back to the 11th century. While non-sacred music was forbidden and skomorochs were oftentimes prosecuted for practicing music during these times of prohibition, they were also tolerated by the church to a degree, like they could only play when they were asked to. Even the fourth, who became star in the middle of the 16th century, loosened that band since he was an avid supporter of music and a composer of sacred and secular music himself. But instruments were forbidden once again in the 1630s, especially with the enactment by Alexei Mikhailovich, after which you couldn't even own instruments. Starting in the 18th century, more and more influences came from Europe, though some composers deliberately stayed away from using the techniques of Western composers, like developing musical motives introduced in their works, to sound different from Western composers. We won't focus on that era of Russian music though, there is a lot of content on later Russian music out there, especially concerning the Romantic era as opposed to Russian folk music. Alright, let's get to the instruments. I deliberately left out instruments that are either hard to come by, don't have any modern counterparts that can serve as replacements, or don't seem to be relevant enough for Russian folk music as to not overload this video. Many instruments, especially the early ones, were mainly used as signal tools by shepherds to scare off wild animals or to signal townspeople, just like the first one we will be talking about. The Barabanka, which is a wooden board that was hit with sticks. Next up are Tresciotki, or rattles in English. These are small wooden tablets strung together. They were usually played by women as accompaniment for wedding ceremonies or praise hymns. The problem with the name is that Rishotki pretty much just literally means rattles, as in something that rattles. 
So there are many variations of Trishotki that mainly have in common that they rattle, but still look and play differently. Next are Loshki, or spoons in English. These are two or more wooden spoons that are hit together. It sounds simple, but you can get pretty virtuous with them. Next are bells. Bell music was a huge thing in Novgorod, as some history books I've read cited. It might have been one of the few types of instrumental music that wasn't frowned upon by the church. Now let's move on to the stringed instruments. The gusli is pretty similar to harps sound-wise, and it's pretty much the precursor to other Russian stringed instruments. The strings were oftentimes either out of steel or sometimes out of guts, and the instrument was tuned in the major scale with fourth, fifth, or fourth and fifth added at the very bottom. An example would be B, E, F sharp, G sharp, A, B, C sharp. G sharp, E, etc. There are two types of gusli, wing shaped and helm shaped. The older versions of wing shaped gusli have 4 to 9 strings, and the newer versions have 5 to 12. As for the playing technique, notes that weren't supposed to be played were blocked off with fingers instead of selectively only plucking the intended note. Helm shaped gusli have 11 to 36 strings and are usually played with two hands. Glissandos were a common playing technique for them. Now let's move on to the most well known traditional Russian instrument, the balalaika. It was oftentimes self made out of wood shaving or out of pumpkin. It had only two to three strings at the beginning, but more were added later on. Most modern balalaikas stick to just three strings though. As far as I've seen, the classic tuning is either EEA or AAE, but mostly the former. It was oftentimes played as a trio, with a rojok, which is similar to a wooden oboe or trumpet, and a godok, which is a bowed lute that was later replaced by the violin. The tremolo playing technique, where the player would hit a string really fast in succession, wasn't as normal back then as it is now. It seemed to have mainly belonged to just one school of teaching, but was later adapted into the general repertoire of a balalaika player. An interesting fact is that the balalaika, as Russian as people see it nowadays, lost all of its popularity in the middle of the 19th up to the beginning of the 20th century. Many have never heard of it in Russia during the time period, until it picked up again. The guitar is another typical Russian instrument, which you can especially hear being used in Russian dramas. You could say it's the stereotypical piano of Russia, at least for male musicians. It was oftentimes tuned the following way back then. D, G, C, D if it's a 7 string guitar, G, B and D. Alright, let's move on to the wind instruments. Garmon and Bayan. Those are rather similar to accordions. A garmon is usually everything that isn't an accordion or bayan and comes in different forms. A bayan has one major difference from an accordion. It has only buttons. At first garmons only came with the tonic and the dominant as functions, later with the subdominant and even later with mall parallels. The tonica parallel being the more popular parallel.
Ты меня обидела, мое сердце ранила. Next up is the Svirel, but there isn't too much interesting to say about it. Its modern recreations usually don't sound much different from normal flutes. These are either clarinets, oboe or trumpet similar instruments made of wood with finger holes. Now you usually can't find instruments like rojok or godox that easily and even if you do, you might not know how to play them and finding sound fonts or VSTs of those instruments is practically impossible. But there are modern counterparts that you can use. Flutes instead of swirel, clarinets and oboes and regular trumpets, although the latter won't be as close sound-wise instead of rojok, harps instead of gusli, violins instead of gudok, accordion or better yet the bayan, which are still available, and guitars and balalaikas, which are still easy to come by as well. The only VSTs I know of that have Russian instruments are the Ilya Efimov ones, which are great. They have a Russian folk series with reasonably priced libraries for the Balalaika and Bayan. I'm not sponsored by them, but I wish I was. Let me know if you know of any more VSTs that have traditional Russian instruments. Now, as I mentioned, some instruments were used as signal instruments, and I have some of the patterns played right here. They could potentially be used in media music to get some historical accuracy or an interesting reference in there. I used an oboe VST to make it sound more similar to the rojok. Now let's get to the juicier part, the theoretical concepts behind traditional Russian music. In this segment I'll give you the hard facts and in the next one, the analysis, we will be looking at pieces that have some of these characteristics. Folk songs had a rather small range, which was between a fourth and a sixth. This isn't too unusual for folk songs, since they are supposed to be sung by laymen as well, so it's not an element exclusive to Russian music. Same is true for the main harmonical functions, being the tonic, the subdominant and the dominant. Some example harmony patterns are these here. And this one especially for Chastushki. Check out my previous video if you don't know what Chastushki are. Characteristic is apparently also a falling fourth jump, though I found that oftentimes an ascending fourth at the start of a phrase is even more common. Folk songs oftentimes end on unisono or octave parallels. Umpa rhythms, that you might know from marches, were common as well, partly because it's a main playing technique for accordion type instruments. Dances oftentimes had a 2 fourth meter. One really important element is also the drone, that's usually a low note that's held throughout the whole piece or a whole section. We'll see examples of that in a bit. Many Russian pieces are also rather fast, especially but not exclusively those that are supposed to be cheerful. Then some things that I personally noticed when I looked at more modern typical Russian pieces is that there's lots of speeding up and slowing down involved in Russian pieces or ritardando and accelerando in musical terms. 
A piece would, for example, start out slow and get faster and faster, and then suddenly slow down at the peak, just to speed up again. Kalinka is a prime example for that. They were oftentimes in ABB form, with the B part usually being the refrain, and the main chords used in typical sounding Russian music are the minor tonic, minor subdominant, the dominant, and the intermediary dominant to the subdominant. Note that this mostly applies to more modern Russian music. Russian folk music seems to have stuck mostly to the tonic, the subdominant, and the dominant, as I mentioned previously. In regards to instrumentation, I have to add that many also think of big brass ensembles due to how militant Russia might feel, and because of the size of the country that is oftentimes mirrored with ground brass ensembles. Alright, let's get to the analysis to showcase all the previously mentioned elements. We will start off with historically accurate traditional Russian music. The book by Ulrich Morgenstern, which I've mentioned at the very beginning, had quite a few examples of traditional Russian music and I've tried to emulate them by using the VSTs I had available. I also didn't focus on making it sound great, so it definitely sounds rather raw, but I think it should suffice in showing off how it approximately sounded. The following is an example of a wing-shaped gusli piece. Since the gusli sounds similar to a harp, I used a harp VST. You can see a drone fifth interval in the bottom system, which corresponds to what we know was typical for Russian folk music. The melody range of this piece is rather big, but that's mostly because no one is singing to it, which is also true for the rest of the examples. You can see how it is speeding up in both cases and there is again a drone tone, in this case the E. Here you can hear the typical umpa rhythm. The main functions being used here are the tonic, the subdominant and the dominant. The second example is in major, but still shares similar properties, like typical umpa rhythm and it mainly being confined to the tonic, subdominant and dominant. Interesting this time is though that the double dominant is present as well. There are some places where the accordion player probably misplayed in the original recording that the author transcribed. Now let's move on to what people actually think of when they think of Russian music. We'll start off with what Mchitsa Troika Pochtovaya, or the Troika male is rushing, in English. As an example I've used a more traditionally Russian sounding cover by the Russian folk ensemble Balalaika, which is also more well known in the West than the original song.
You can see an ascending fourth here right at the beginning of the phrase. There's also the distinctive umpa rhythm. There are also places where the balalaika does the typical tremolo. Then the last phrase is repeated. The harmonization consists of pretty much just the tonic, the subdominant and the dominant. Let's move on to a piece that most people know, Katusha. There's an ascending fourth at the refrain, and it's usually performed with an umpa rhythm. The harmonization consists of the tonic, the subdominant, the dominant, and the intermediary dominant to the subdominant. The last phrase is repeated once again. Something interesting I came across by researching Russian music was Sheet Music Boss's channel, who makes Russian sounding arrangements of non-Russian songs, among other arrangements. Here are a few examples. What he mainly did was making them minor, adding an umpa rhythm and then adding ritardandos and accelerandos. Cielo Ludi is another band that rustified some non-Russian songs. One of their most well-known pieces is It's My Life, which is mainly made to sound Russian by using traditional Russian instruments and applying their respective playing techniques, like the tremolo on the balalaika or the umpa rhythm on the accordion. The heavy Russian accent helped a lot too. The classical imagining of Russian music is in Russischen Dorfe, or in the Russian village in English. The beginning has a drone tone. And the second part has a dance meter with the 2 fourth and an umpa rhythm, even though it's not a march. The composer really did his research, since it aligns with many traditional Russian music features that we've talked about. Speaking of marches, Johann Strauss made a piece called Russischer March, or Russian March in English. It's the kind of music that we would associate with Russia because of its militant feeling, the danger signal tones and its minor key. Now let's take a look at a real Russian march. Well, sounds like it could be the march of any country, doesn't it? Listen through this recording of the Victory Day 2017, where they play lots of Russian marches, and you will find other marches in major that you wouldn't necessarily associate with Russia. But it is still true that there are still many Russian marches in minor. They are way more uncommon in America, for example, although they do exist, like for example, Nobles of the Mystic Shrine.
Then there's another thing that I personally always connected to Russian music. Russian movies, especially dramas. My mother watched them, as I've mentioned in my previous video, and therefore I overheard lots of their music. Let's start with Beloe Sonse Pustini, or White Sun of the Desert, as it is known in the West, and take a look at the piece Vashe Blagorodie, or Your Honor, Honor as in someone's title. <laughs> One thing that we've already encountered countless times is the umpa rhythm of the guitar. The guitar is also a typical Russian instrument, as we've discussed previously. That hoarse male singer voice that you hear at the beginning is also typical for these songs in Russian dramas. The harmonies also center around the tonic, the subdominant and the dominant, and the intermediary dominant to the subdominant. Other than that, the B part gets repeated once again. There is more harmonical variety this time though, as we venture into the parallels like the subdominant parallel, dominant parallel and the tonica parallel, especially in the refrain, where the tension rises. Next up is Tamzat Manami, or There Behind the Fog, from the movie 72 Metra, or 72 Meters. You can hear the hoarse voice once again, and once again it has the typical features of mostly centering around the tonic, subdominant, dominant, and the intermediary dominant to the subdominant, with the addition of the tonic parallel. Там за туманами, вечными пьяными, Там за туманами берег наш родной. Там за туманами. And the B part is again being repeated. Там за туманами берег наш родной. The last piece we'll be looking at is an original piece made by me. I guess it's a way for me to show you how you could apply the things that you've learned in this video. I've called it Otkriti Holodilnik, which is, um, well, in English, open refrigerator. It's, I guess, kind of uh, an insider, you could say. If someone randomly asks me, teach me something in Russian, I usually teach the, them Otkriti Holodilnik, which is just open refrigerator. And that's all you need to know if you want to survive in Russia. All right, let's listen to it.
Alright, let's start with the instruments. The instruments I've used are the Domra, the Alto Domra, the Balalaika, the Contrabass Balalaika, the Bayan, the art is a bit glitched, and Claps from the Slavic Women's Core. I've used the Slavic Women's Core in my piece Scissors from my album Hope and Despair. So if you're interested in finding out what it can do, I'd recommend listening to the piece or watching my showcase video on it on my channel. I've mainly used the claps, but there are also stumps and general chatter or banter. Or more like random noises. And there's the, of course also brief sounds. Okay, we'll start with the intro here. Alright, that's the intro. I just started the piece out slow uh, to build it up with uh, an accelerando, which is, as I've mentioned, a uh, typical technique used in more modern Russian music or even traditional Russian music. The Dombra has a fourth jump here, right at the beginning. And there's a tremolo played by a Laika. The chords used are the tonic, which is C minor, the subtonant, which is F minor, and the dominant, which is G major. And then the bayan sits in. Thing is that the lower octave of the bayan is used for the bass notes. And then the next octaves are used for major, minor, and dominant seven and so on. And here are the minor ones. So you pretty much just press one key to play a minor chord. And I've also used an accelerando here when the bayan sets in. Alright, let's listen to the first part of this A section. A few modulation to make it sound more realistic and more expressive. So the main chords used here are again the tonic, subdominant and the dominant and the right side of the bayan has a rather fast melody. Keep especially this pattern in mind as we will encounter it in a bit again. Other than that there's not much to say about this. Just typical because it's played by a bayan. Then we get to the second part. As I mentioned in the music theory section of this video, typical Russian pieces are oftentimes in ABB form and this is what this first part is in. This whole part with the bayan solo is the A part, this is only the intro, and then we get to the B part, which is then repeated once again over here. It is accompanied by Balaika and by the Bayan to make it sound more expressive. The repetition of the B part is usually stronger. How this being led into this part is with a C dominant 7 chord. which is the intermediary dominant to the subdominant, which is a typical chord, as we've discussed previously. And it leads right into the subdominant, which is F minor. And then it continues again to the C minor, which is the tonic, then the dominant and the intermediary dominant to the subdominant, just to be repeated again. And then starts the transition into the B section of this whole piece. So I didn't pay much attention to how play or how performable it would be, since I don't expect it to be actually performed by Domra and Balaika and Bayan players. But the problem with this arrangement would be that, for example, this in C minor but to make it easier to play you would usually make it in A minor or I've also seen pieces in E or A major. So C minor isn't like a typical scale. 
by far. And other than that, you have the Domra here. So usually the Domra is either tuned in or if it has four strings, G, which I don't have here in this VST, E, A, D. So I think it might be performable this way, like you would use the G string to play the D, the E string to play the C, or the A string to play the C, and the D string to play the A. That's why these notes aren't held, to make it at least a bit performable. I also use the Domra for this section instead of Balalaika because I preferred its more clear sound over the Balalaikas. All right, let's listen to the B section. It's mostly improvised and the most important part is that there's a drone tone here on the D. Usually a more typical drone tone would be the E or in the case of the Domra, maybe even the G on the fourth string. But as I said, I didn't really pay much attention to the performability, but just to this sound, to make it sound traditional Russian or typical Russian, since I didn't want to restrict myself, but focus more on actually using the techniques. There we go, the A part is pretty much the same as this A part, minus the intro, just that there's more going on. There's for example the contrabass balalaika playing a pattern, and the domra is accompanying the main melody by the bayan, and there's the clapping of course. And the most important part, there's a pretty heavy accelerando. <laughs> There we go, and after that the outro begins. Just way slower. Slows down by quite a lot, and then suddenly it jumps back up to have like a grand finale. And there you have it. This is one example of a way in which you can use the techniques you've learned from this video to make a traditional or typical Russian sounding piece. Alright, I think that's enough examples. I hope this gave you a good overview on what makes Russian instrumental music sound Russian. And let me know if you have any questions or if you want to add anything. As I mentioned, the sources are in the description. And well, I don't think I'll be making one of these for a while now, since this one took forever to make. Alright, see ya!